this is Arvind Singhal, and today I'll be having a conversation with you about Positive Deviance approach to addressing and solving complex problems. Uh, the approach uh, privileges the notion of harnessing a wisdom that's distributed and that is hidden. So uh, the image that you see perhaps is a visual representation uh, of how certain problems uh, can be solved. Let me begin by expressing a deep sense of gratitude to my mentors, Monique and Jerry Sternen, who introduced me to the Positive Deviance approach. Uh, Jerry is no longer with us. Uh, he passed away in 2008, um, but I was very fortunate to uh, sort of uh, apprentice with him, learn, uh, from him, uh, you know, whenever he was uh, available uh, and had the opportunity to uh, work on a few workshops and a few projects with him. Uh, Monique is a wonderful supporter and uh, so a deep bow uh, to uh, Monique and Jerry for uh, teaching me a little bit about this positive de uh, deviance approach. I want to begin with a blank screen. Uh, you know, the Zen philosophers say, that a beginner's mind is an open mind. Uh, it's full of possibilities. And the blank screen in some ways is an invitation for us to be curious, for us to, if we can, uh, reset our buttons uh, to uh, zero. And if we can, I think uh, the positive deviance approach will likely uh, make a little uh, more sense. Now, I said that the positive deviance approach is uh, an approach that harnesses uh, hidden and distributed wisdom. And in order to find uh, the hidden and distributed wisdom, one needs to flip uh, the traditional dominant and hegemonic ways of thinking. Uh, you know, we develop a sort of a trained incapacity uh, we are incapacitated by our training, the way we are trained, for instance, to look at the normal curve, to make inferences, and so on. And so the positive deviance approach is an invitation for us to flip uh, these uh, dominant and hegemonic ways of thinking. And there's a reason why we do that. The purpose of these mental flips, or call them mental somersaults, is as I've said, to get over our trained incapacities and to ask questions that we usually do not ask. Uh, so, you know, these are highly improbable questions that are asked uh, in the positive deviance approach. It deviates phenomenally from the hypothetical deductive methods, hypothesis, testing, making inferences, uh, you know, from a a sample to a population, the kinds of uh, social science research techniques that we are trained in. So I want to begin uh, our conversation by reading to you, uh, with your permission, a poem by uh, Khalil uh, Gibran. And the poem is about uh, the I. In fact, that's what its title is. Said the eye one day, I see beyond these valleys, a mountain veiled with blue mist. Is it not beautiful? The ear listened and after listening intently a while said, but where is any mountain? I do not hear it. Then the hand spoke and said, I'm trying in vain to feel or to touch it. And I can find no mountain. And the nose said, there is no mountain. I cannot smell it. Then the eye turned the other way and they all began to talk together about the eye's strange delusion. And they said, something must be the matter with the eye. So this approach, the positive deviance approach fundamentally asks dialectical questions. And the questions are in the spirit of what is it that we see? And also what is it that we don't see? Or what is it that we hear? And what is it that we don't hear? And what is it that we can touch and feel? And what is it that we 
cannot touch and feel? And what is it that we can smell? And what is it that we cannot smell? And it's an invitation for us to be fully present as we take part in uh, understanding a problem, uh, having all our senses energized, all the antennas up, so that the hidden and distributed wisdom begins to resonate with a certain frequency among us. And perhaps it is also to say that uh, given this is a lecture that's given in the context of COVID-19, that like the invisible viruses, you know, and I've done some work with polio and HIV and uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus, uh, these hospital acquired infection superbugs, or now with COVID-19, these viruses need a medium or a media to spread. You no, know, I think it was somebody who said that virus is nothing. A medium is everything. Uh, similarly, the essential nature of the positive deviance approach is communicative and international. And I hope to make this point as uh, we move forward. Now, I have to beg for your forgiveness uh, as opposed to having neatly bulleted uh, points about what the positive deviance approach is. I'm going to indulge in a little bit of uh, narrative storytelling. And uh, hopefully in telling these three stories, you will begin to grasp the kind of mental somersaults, the mental flips, the questioning, the challenging of the dominant modes uh, to thinking that we are attuned to. And uh, the first story, which hopefully will allow us to do a mental somersault, uh, very relevant to positive deviance thinking is a story about Abraham Lincoln, our 15th president, uh, perhaps one of the greatest presidents. Uh, not only was he a great president, he was the tallest uh, president. Uh, he was six foot, uh, four and a half inches tall, if you add his stovepipe hat, which he uh, wore with great pride. Um, he was more than a seven footer. And there's a story of Lincoln once being asked by a petty soldier who, you know, came and who clicked his heels and saluted him and extended his hand. And he said, oh, Mr. President, you're tall. How tall are you? And without batting an eyelid, Lincoln said, son, like you, tall enough that my feet reach the ground. Now, most of us, for instance, when I'm asked, uh, single, how tall are you? You know, I may say something like, I'm five feet, nine inches tall, uh, or I may say something like, I'm 174 centimeters or 1.74 meters. Usually to an expert, we are very, very precise. We you know, know to make the distinction between uh, I'm taller than you, I'm more well-to-do than you. We make distinctions like I drive this car and you drive that car. Uh, I'm whiter than you. I'm, you know, all the uh, analytical distinctions that we are so well trained uh, to make. However, what Lincoln does when he's asked, uh, Mr. President, how tall are you? He says, again, son, like you, tall enough that my feet reach the ground. And if you sort of do a little analysis, you know, what does uh, son uh, like you uh, denote? No, it shows a relational emphasis and a sense of humility, which basically is uh, uh, saying uh, to the petty soldier that, yeah, I may be the president, I may be the commander in chief, I may be six foot, four inches tall, uh, but you and I stand on the same common ground. And the implication of this story, this is not the way we usually think. The implication of this story is that Wisdom is distributed. It lies uh, at the common ground. It can be accessible to anybody. And it just doesn't lie with the expert. It can lie with the ones who are 
uh, the least seen, uh, the least um, uh, beholden for uh, having such wisdom, and traditionally who are often overlooked or marginalized or silenced. So this is one mental flip. If you can believe that wisdom is distributed. Mental somersault two uh, is well illustrated in a story uh, with Mother Teresa. I was fortunate uh, when uh, I was living and growing up in India, I had a correspondence relationship with Mother Teresa. And so I've been a collector of Mother Teresa's stories. And there's one story which is particularly uh, of a relevance uh, to understand this mental somersault uh, of the positive deviance approach. Uh, the story goes that uh, Mother Teresa arrived in Washington, D.C., 1974, Dallas Airport. You know, she was expecting two sisters from the Missionaries of Charity uh, to receive her at the airport. You know, she was looking for the white saris with the blue bands. And uh, standing between her and these two sisters were only a thousand people who had gotten word that Mother Teresa was in town and who had placards and, you know, they were sort of like singing. And one of the representatives walked up to Mother Teresa and said, Mother, tomorrow we're having a march in Washington and we'd like for you to march with us. And Mother said to my child, what is the march about? And the representative said, tomorrow we are having a march in Washington against the Vietnam War. And we'd like for you to march with us. And there was silence. And you know, then the representative asked again, so you will march with us, right? And mother said, well, if you're going to have a march in Washington against the Vietnam War, I am so sorry, my child. However, if you were to choose to have a march in Washington for peace, I will be the first to lead. Now, Mother Teresa's response has tremendous implications for how we as problem solvers try to solve problems. Most of us are, if you're trying to solve a problem against something, we begin with the problem. You know? We begin by asking what's not working. We begin by asking what are the deficits. We begin by asking what are we up against, like against the war. Rarely do we flip and ask what we are for. And what Mother Teresa is telling us, yes, you can make a choice as a problem solver to begin with the problem, what you're up against, or you may make a choice of asking, what are you for? And this is not an inconsequential flip or some salt, because if as a problem solver, you begin to ask, what are you for? Then you can begin to look at the assets as opposed to what's not working, you can ask what's working. And that will lead you to a very different place. So this is uh, mental somersault number two. Again, we are not trained uh, to think that way. Uh, every thesis, every research project begins with the question or with the problem statement. And once you begin with the problem statement, you head down a path uh, which will take you to a different place um, in contrast to asking what are you for. All right, uh, the third uh, narrative uh, story, which is critical to understanding the positive deviance approach, the third mental somersault uh, is well illustrated in this picture of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, he was known as Bapu to most Indians, father, loving father. Uh, also, of course, uh, known as Rashtrapita, which means father of the Indian nation. And uh, the father of the Indian nation lived and worked like a poor man. He was often uh, deeply inspired by John Ruskin, would say that, you know, uh, his purpose in life was to reduce himself to zero. You know, the notion of unto this last, which was the title of John Ruskin's book, uh, or putting in some ways the last first. 
And uh, you can see, if you look at the top left, uh, that he's traveling by train uh, and he's traveling third class. And uh, I am uh, the first uh, generation uh, of uh, Indians to be born in a free India. But you can imagine people like my grandfather or, you know, my parents uh, addressing the father of the Indian nation as also journalists and saying, Bapu, why do you travel third class? You know, we as a country can do better. And his response was always the same. And he would say, I travel third class because as you know, there is no fourth class. I travel third class because as you know, there is no fourth class. And what Gandhi is telling us, or what Bapu is telling us, is that if in our equation of problem solving, if we can factor in the calculus of the fourth class, the ones who are the most mar marginalized, the ones who are always overlooked, then again, uh, the equation would look very, very different. We as problem solvers are often uh, beset with, uh, fascinated by what are called best practices. And what Bapu is telling us, well, you know, best practices are fine. Like Lincoln is telling us, yeah, six foot four inches is fine. Or like Mother Teresa is telling us, yeah, there's nothing really wrong with marching, you know, against the Vietnam War. But they are also saying, yes, I'm tall enough that I stand on common ground. If you choose to have a march for peace, I'm the first to lead. And I travel third class because there is no fourth class. A very, very different way of thinking. Bapu is saying, begin to look at things from the worst case scenario, from the perspective of the fourth class, the ones who face the highest odds, and you'd be at a different place. Now, how can we take these three flips that I've uh, in some ways tried to illustrate through these three stories and bring them together to solve and address highly complex problems. And uh, I want to illustrate uh, with an example of how these triple somersaults can be used uh, or were used to solve the problem of malnutrition in Vietnam. And at the center of this story uh, are my mentors, uh, Monique and Jerry Sternen, who arrived in Vietnam in December, 1990. And they were the first people to operationalize, codify, systematize the positive deviance approach because when they arrived in Vietnam, 65% of the kids in Vietnam were severely malnourished. It was a big problem. And through a strange set of coincidences and uh, opportunities, uh, they asked a question, an improbable question, a positively deviant question that had not been asked before. And uh, the question, and this is a picture of Jerry, you know, whenever you sat across from him, he was sort of, you know, flipping. He was saying, yeah, you know, make that 180 degree flip. Do that mental somersault. This picture was taken by my dear friend, David Gasser, and it captures the flip of the positive deviance approach so well. So Jerry and Monique uh, working very closely with the four village communities. That's how they started in Panoa province, uh, close to Hanoi, asked a triple somersault question. And this triple somersault question was a data-driven question. So one of the things we have to say is that positive deviance is completely baked in data. And I like data, I was trained as an engineer, and there's value in data. What we are saying is we tend to look at data in ways that it privileges what's not working. That's the reason why we are all obsessed with you know, the leading causes of uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, very few of us ask life-giving questions like what's working. You know? So the question that was asked 
the improbable data-driven question. If you've learned hypothesis testing, if you work in the deductive hypothetical mode, you will never ask this question. The question was simply, are there children under the age of five from very poor rural households that are well nourished? Now, for us who were trained in regression equations and prediction and control, this is not what you would predict. In essence, positive deviance questions the hegemonic ways in which we think about regression or the line of best fit. The question here is a highly improbable question. In fact, it is a fairly implausible question. It's an almost impossible question. Because you would expect that children who come from the poorest of the poor rural households will be severely malnourished. And indeed, that is the case. Most of them are severely malnourished. But here you're interested in the outliers, uh, the ones who have deviated from the norm in a statistical sense, not in a sociological sense, in a statistical sense, and who have solved the problem. And of course, the notion of the very poor rural households in the question refers to Gandhi's fourth class, which you've probably figured out. You're bringing that into the equation, into the calculus. And when you say, are there children from poor rural households who are well-nourished, the well-nourished is what you are for. That's the Mother Teresa uh, flip and so and so. So these three simple stories come together uh, to ask, uh, these three mental somersaults come together to ask, is there somebody out here whom we least expect to have solved the problem who actually has solved the problem? And these are from people from the most marginalized. These are people from the subaltern margins whom you least expect to have any expertise, but the notion of the distributed wisdom among them. So when a question like this was asked, the answer was yes. Data-driven question, you know, they weighed all the kids, they plotted their growth charts, and they found that there were about a few dozen, two dozen kids among the 3,000 who were weighed who were very well nourished. That's less than a percent, a rounding error. And of course, you know, we know when we do social science work and hypothesis testing, we basically, happiness is, you know, P less than equal to 0.05. Uh, you know, it's a probabilistic uh, universe that we live in that, okay, you can say with a reasonable degree of confidence, 95%, that uh, what you are predicting or what you're finding through your data, through measurement, uh, is indeed likely uh, to be the case. Here, you're talking about less than 1%, but the data shows that they were well, well nourished. And the data also showed that they were coming from very poor families. So the premise here is that they've solved the problem in their own context, in their own cultural container. These people have solved the problem. They have the answers. And as opposed to bringing in an expert, a commander in chief, um, a president, uh, as in the Lincolnian case, the wisdom is distributed with the ones that one least expects to have this wisdom. So basically to emphasize the point uh, that uh, positive deviance uh, questions uh, in a very basic way uh, the tenets uh, of the normal curve as it is employed by us to make inferences from a certain sample to a population with a reasonable degree of probability. Here, you are asking an improbable question. Uh, it's the who done it. Who amongst the poorest of the poor has done it? And if they have done it based on data, then it behooves us to ask, what is that hidden and distributed wisdom? What's the answer? What is it that they are doing which is making the difference because they must be doing something. They don't have the resources given they are the fourth class to feed their children well, but they must be doing something which is uncommon, which others are not doing, which helps solve the problem. So the question of course, 
What uncommon practices were self-discovered by the families in Vietnam that were accessible to all? And here the notion of self-discovery is critical. When one does positive deviance work, you begin with the community. You take their help uh, and you listen to their discourses to define what the problem is. The community is the one that goes out and weighs the kids. They are the ones who say, oh, impossible. What, 24 kids, the poorest of the poor, who are well nourished. And they are the ones who then are challenged to go and self-discover. What is it that these families are doing that's uncommon? And so what did they find? And of course, the notion of the uncommon practices of common people is the Lincolnian notion of being on common ground, uh, the notion of distributed uh, wisdom. So what did they find? One of the findings of an uncommon practice for these marginalized poorest of the poor whose children were well nourished is that they fed their children, not sweet potatoes as you see, but the greens of sweet potato plants. The normative practice was to only focus on the potato. The normative practice was to take the grains, feed them to the goats, feed them to the cows, you know, put them in a compost bin, use them as fertilizer. However, some mothers were engaging in a practice variation, which was uncommon. They were using these greens to add to the broth, to the pho, to the rice, to the soup. And of course, now you can put on your expert hat and say, what difference does it make? And you can do an analysis and you'll find that uh, sweet potato greens have beta carotene, vitamin A, the miracle vitamin. It has a whole host of minerals. It has magnesium and calcium and iron and uh, well, so now you, of course, have your explanation. So it's the deviation in practice, the positively deviant practice in the statistical sense, which was making the difference. Now, they also found that there were some mothers who were picking up these teeny tiny shrimps and crabs from the rice fields. And Vietnam is a country which is full of rice fields. It's a country where you can grow three crops of rice in a year. Rice has a cropping cycle of 120 days. And what that means is that the rice fields, which are waterlogged most of the time, uh, also have teeny tiny shrimps and crabs, shellfish, uh, crustaceans, little snails. And too often, given they are there for the taking, this is not considered as being food for humans. Uh, if you want to eat shrimps and crabs, you pick them up from a river or you pick them up from the ocean. Um, these are teeny tiny shrimps and crabs. And the perception was that this food, the crustacean food was not good for children. So what were these mothers doing that was uncommon as was self-discovered by the community was that they were spending a little time in the rice fields after they finished their work, they would bend down and pick up these teeny tiny shrimps and crabs, come home and remove the crust. And now you're left with a little pulp. And the variant practice was they would add the pulp uh, to the child's meal. And we all know what the pulp contains. It's protein, it's uh, maybe some carbs, and uh, we know how central they are for a child's so again, the answer was there, and it was there uh, with whom you least expect it uh, to be there. And it was only discovered because you asked a question that's usually not asked, questioning, challenging the dominant and hegemonic ways in which we are trained to do work. There's nothing wrong with a height as six foot, four and a half inches. There's nothing wrong with uh, uh, being against the war, uh, what positive deviance is saying. And also, of course, there's nothing wrong with the best practice, but what the positive deviance approach is saying. If you flip 
you will be at a different place and you will identify and find this hidden and distributed wisdom, which can help solve these problems. Another little behavior they found, which was uncommon, uh, was that uh, the children who were well-nourished were actively fed by their mothers. Uh, the normative practice was, you know, when a child begins to sit, you take some and you, uh, you know, you put it in front of them and the child, you know, takes some and eats some and leaves some and drops some and wastes some. In this case, uh, the mother actively fed the child so that each last kernel uh, went into the child's uh, body. And also, of course, it fosters close bonding, a sense of care, uh, which is very communicative, as we know, uh, in nature. You feed the child, you know, a few times a day, and this bonding, uh, iterative, repeated, uh, the child and you connecting and bonding in a different way, becomes the medium for a little more than just nutrition uh, to be uh, transmitted. So, of course, then you ask the question, you identified these practices, what do you do with them? Do you just tell people? Do you show them what to do? Uh, and here again, there is a flip. There's a mental somersault. What Jerry and Monique Stern and discovered in Vietnam is exemplified by how an elder uh, responded to the intervention. The elder said, a thousand hearings is not equal to one seeing and a thousand seeings is not equal to one doing. And so as opposed to telling people, as opposed to showing them, the positive deviance approach flipped what is typically, you know, I was trained in stages of change. We often talk about knowledge, attitude, practice. Uh, if you, uh, you know, want to have more subtlety, you get into pre-contemplation and contemplation and, you know, you come up with the notion of behavioral intention and actual practice of behaviors and maintenance. I mean, you know, we've got all these hierarchies of change, uh, beginning with knowledge. And how do we move people around that continuum? Positive deviance, again, flips that completely. It begins with practice. And the simple notion there, as uh, often Jerry would tell us, is it is far easier for us as human beings to act our way into a new way of thinking than it is for us to think our way into a new way of acting. And most of us, when we implement expert-driven interventions, at you know the marginalized, the poorest of the poor, who we think are ignorant, we basically try to tell them, show them, uh, and then of course you know they have the option of whether or not they're going to do it. And there's often an immune response. We know when people are told do this, it's like mm, you know who are you? And that was also the initial experience in Vietnam. But when they flipped the notion of beginning with practice, you soon discover that, oh, women do get together and cook. It's a social activity. And so in essence, uh, cooking sessions and feeding sessions were set up because they were part of the culture. This was a practice that was happening. It was aligned with the way people were leading their lives. And you can imagine what happened, the host. Um, and in Vietnam, you have this notion that if you are the host, you can, uh, when you invite people, ask them for a little price of admission. No, because people ask, what should I bring? And you can imagine the host uh, telling them, okay, I'd like you to get, as you've guessed, uh, the greens of sweet potato plants. And you know, the person may say, what, you want those? Yes, I would like you to get fresh greens. So the person has to go out to the field and pluck the greens, they have to act their way and they have to wash it and they have to bring it covered in a bowl. And then some people were asked to bring shrimps and 
crabs and shellfish and you know they have to go to the field and they've got to pick them up act their way and then they have to come home and remove the crust and wash it and bring it in a bowl and then they get together and cook and you know so okay add the sweet potato shoots add the snails add you know the little shrimps and crab pulp and uh, then of course you actively feed your child because the mother's also brought their child but we also know the value of doing baselines and why not so the mothers were first asked before they fed their children to actually weigh their kids and plot it in front of others no and uh, uh, you know, so you see at day one where your child is and, uh, you know, then when the mothers go home, they are said, well, look, you know, your child uh, did pretty well with the green shoots and with the shrimps and crabs. So, you know, maybe you want to continue that. And again, if they continue it, they have to go out to the field, act their way and come and clean and remove the crust and add it. And so this forms a practice. And so they had uh, several cooking sessions, let's say 10 cooking sessions in different homes over a three week period. So at least 10 times you have acted your way, if not more. And then each session before you feed your child, you weigh your child, you mark it, and you can imagine what happens at the end of 21 days. Do you really need to convince any of the mothers because the babies are now a little bouncier than they were. And they have themselves self-monitored their progress, the progress of their child. So this case of Vietnam is well documented. It helped systematize, uh, codify the positive deviance approach along with other experiences that happened post-Vietnam. Now we know the positive deviance approach has been implemented in over 50 or 60 countries, you know, uh, thousands of projects, uh, I would say, uh, dealing with complex issues, going beyond malnutrition. There have been positive deviance work with female genital cutting, positive deviance work with hospital-acquired infections, positive deviance work with um, uh, racial discrimination, positive deviance work with uh, name a complex problem. And uh, uh, it's been there. Reintegration of child soldiers. I was involved in a project uh, in Uganda, looking at sex trafficking in Indonesia. Uh, highly, highly complex issues and uh, finding a way to address them through the distributed wisdom that exists. So what happened in Vietnam, and this is well documented, you can read the special issue of Food and Nutrition Bulletin. Um, uh, Vietnam solved its malnutrition problem with wisdom from within by finding the practice variations, by harnessing the distributed wisdom, and then finding a way to amplify them through an emphasis on practice, Vietnam pretty much solved its problem. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, how the positive deviance approach has been used or can be used to addressing invisible viruses. And we can give you a few illustrations very quickly and hopefully you'll see the thread. And again, I'll use some stories. So much like the question in Vietnam uh, to address the issue of uh, malnutrition uh, in a commercial sex brothel in Indonesia, a similar question was asked. And this, the problem here, of course, is rising rates of HIV amongst commercial sex workers. And it's, again, the most marginalized, the most vulnerable, the most silenced, the most rejected uh, members uh, of any uh, community, highly stigmatized, they're mostly women. Uh, and they have very little, you can imagine, leverage in terms of negotiating condom use. You know, if you've got to feed yourself and your children, you go with, uh, let's say, uh, no condoms and uh, the rates of HIV were rising. So the question was simply asked, are there commercial sex workers who've been in the trade for over five years and average multiple clients, this is the fourth class, they're at the highest risk, uh, and who, for some strange reason, unexplainable, implausible, 
uh, improbable, uh, can successfully negotiate condominiums and who also have been tested. And if you look at their tests, the last three tests, every six months, they've been HIV free. And what the heck are they doing? No? What's the equivalent of the green shoots and uh, the crabs and uh, the shellfish and the active feeding? And the answers were pretty interesting. You know, in a brothel, several uh, dozens or hundreds of commercial sex workers, they indeed found a few who, again, you know, one or two percent who met this criteria against all odds that these mental somersaults had found a better outcome, you know, that they could negotiate condom use regularly, consistently, and also were HIV free. So you ask, what is it that they were doing? Well, normative practice was that, you know, when a client walked in, they were trained by USAID and World Bank and local NGOs that you, you know, bring out the condom and, you know, it's like time out, let's talk about this. However, these commercial sex workers did none of that. When a client came, they let the client in, no mention of condom, and they gave the clients, they began to give the clients what the client wanted. You know? And uh, this was self-discovered by other commercial sex workers. You know, what's the little thing they're doing that's uncommon? So no talk of condoms. Uh, and basically, they would tease the client. You know? They would uh, rub them here and massage them there and... Uh, get them all worked up. And in the words of these commercial sex workers, when the client uh, was at a point of no return, and you can probably imagine what that is, and people have a good palpable sense of when a man uh, who's been teased uh, in certain erotic ways is at a point of no return. It's then that they brought out the content. It's an issue of timing. No, I mean, with COVID-19, we know the importance of timing. Uh, a pandemic, you know, is like a raging fire. And if you can, uh, uh, timing-wise, move on it quickly, as has been the case with many countries, then you can pretty much extinguish the fire. That's not what happened in the United States. That's not what happened in the UK. But that is what happened in Korea. That is what happened in Senegal. That is what happened in Ghana. There are countries who have done a lot better, much like there are families that have done a lot better with malnutrition. There are commercial sex workers who have done better. So these commercial sex workers were not believing in timeout. Their acts were more in the cultural context of uh, the client and why they were there they were about healthy passions. They were very passionate. They gave the man an adventure that he came uh, for, you know, and when they pulled out the condom, it wasn't like here, you know, here's an ordinary condom. Mm -mm. Uh, you know, they would, again, play to the man's virility and his masculinity. And in that context, of course, prevent, you know, uh, prevent themselves from getting this infection and being successful in negotiating condom by saying, ah, you know, you are a special person and uh, I would love to see you glow in the dark, you know, because I'm going to turn off uh, the light and gee, I mean, you know, so here's a neon condom uh, for you. And you can imagine what that does to a man, no? The notion that I'm going to be glowing in the dark. Or here's a banana condom and uh, here's a, you know, a pineapple condom if this is what you... And again, this is uh, a variation in practice. The norm is, you know, time out here, they are teasing the sense of timing, coming out with uh, choices and the choices again, playing uh, in a cultural context of a brothel and why people are there uh, to uh, the man's notion of what he's there for, you know, for him to achieve what he's there for. Now, it was really interesting when, uh, you know, when one digs with positive deviance, we also found out that some of these commercial sex workers, if a man, even at that time, was uh, not uh, amenable to the notion 
of uh, adopting neon condom, uh, then they would say, and uh, it's interesting what they said. They would say, here, you know, this condom is not for me. I'm a commercial sex worker. You know, I have sex with multiple clients. This is for, it wasn't you or to protect your health. They would say in the exact positively deviant words were, this is for you to protect your reputation. And you know, that would give the clients pause because in any context, but especially in the Asian context, you know, the notion of face, uh, the message was not that, you know, use this to protect yourself, but use this to protect your reputation. Uh, you know, they would say, you're a happily married man, you have children, you know, you're coming to me, a commercial sex worker, uh, you need to use this to protect your reputation. And that almost always had a very, very high degree of compliance. So anyway, practice variations, distributed wisdom in places where you least expect uh, them uh, to be. We did a lot of work. In fact, this was the first uh, implementation of the positive deviance method started in 2005. Um, and had an opportunity to sort of be a scribe, to be a researcher, writer. Uh, we worked with six hospitals. The project was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And the question simply was, the problem that we were trying to address was the superbug infections in hospitals. And you know, there are over 100,000 deaths in the US. It's a public health crisis. The World Health Organization believes that by the year 2030, this would be a mega public health crisis. However, much of it is under the radar. And, you know, most hospitals have infectious disease specialists. Um, but we asked a very different question, a question that speaks to the notion of distributed wisdom. Are there doctors, nurses, transporters, custodians, chaplains who display behaviors that are uncommon, which are useful towards the reduction of these hospital acquired MRSA infections. And when you ask a question like that, your gaze begins to see what you previously have not seen. So for instance, you discovered a hundred different little things that people were doing. A nurse who used her knuckle to press the elevator button, which is a repository of pathogens. You can imagine how many times and if you use a knuckle instead of your fingertips, which we all do as normative practice, and this was validated through some studies, uh, you reduce your hand as being a vector of infection transfer uh, by 80%. You reduce the potency of your hand being a vector of infection transfer. Uh, we found chaplains who would take their Bible and uh, you know touch people's heart with it, and of course, uh, you know, when you're doing that, you're doing a little more than spreading uh, the word of uh, God. Uh, but there were chaplains who had their Bible in a plastic cover, who kept alcohol swabs, who sort of, you know, cleaned uh, the, uh, the Bible, disinfected it uh, before. Uh, and 101 other things, you know, a doctor who didn't wear long sleeves, no white coat, no tie. Uh, who did his rounds in a different way. First, he visited all his non-infected patients who were not in isolation and then went to the infected patient so that he was not cross-contaminating. As I said, a hundred different things. Uh, and uh, uh, in the six pilot hospitals, uh, we reduced in over a three-year period, um, not we, the people in these uh, units, reduced uh, MRSA infections by on average 74%. Unheard of, unbelievable, and done so with the know-how that was with them by identifying this distributed wisdom and finding a way to amplify it by people actually doing these behaviors as opposed to just telling people to do this. Okay, let's talk about COVID-19. And I think I said that there are some countries and you know you can use positive deviance it's a very versatile approach because you can look at individuals you can look at families 
You can look at uh, deviance being at the level of a village uh, or at the level of a brothel or at the level of a unit in a hospital. But you can also look at it at the level of a country. And so Ghana, uh, you know, uh, 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 West African country, uh, so I think uh, if one, if I remember the numbers correctly, uh, it had only about 7,000 cases of uh, COVID-19 and only, and more than 60% of them had recovered and only 25 deaths. Now, this is a country that is very resource poor and we know the importance of testing and tracing. So one of the things Ghana did, and you can do this, uh, especially early on in COVID-19, and this is something they've done, which no other country has done, uh, even though the countries that are talking about it is they did pool testing for COVID-19. And what does pool testing mean? It basically means if you know that the infection rate is low, uh, you can take the blood samples or swabs from a pool of people, you know, could be 20, 30, 40, and you can do a pooled test and, uh, you know, if uh, it is negative, then you know all these 40 people are negative at once. Or if it is positive, then you can look at who may be at the highest risk. And then you test in a way so that you know, uh, you know, then you can go to the individual level of testing. So it's, again, a positively deviant practice in that it, with few test kits, you can do a lot of testing. But of course, you the timing issue is critical. You only do it when there aren't too many uh, cases. Another example from Ghana, it's one of the only countries um, which uses uh, drones and they're called rightly so, zipline drones. And uh, on the lower right, you see Bano and uh, Bano is on the board of zipline. And it does absolutely remarkable work because here are these drones which are, you know, launched from uh, a sort of a, a man-made uh, runway as they accelerate and take off. Uh, and uh, Ghana only has two uh, national testing centers where you can test for COVID-19, but it also has over 6,000 clinics. So you can imagine the difficulty of, you know, a swab or a sample uh, going, you know, over roads and bridges and, uh, you know, when you are in lockdown uh, to these national, how much time that would take. So these zip line drones, they collect samples from these different rural clinics. They are consolidated. And in 15, 20 minutes, through a little parachute, they drop this uh, at these testing centers, the two national testing centers, and soon you have results. So again, you are overcoming uh, the issues of access, uh, the issues of turnaround time, uh, and finding a novel way uh, to do things, which is a variation in practice uh, from your peer countries. Uh, I love the, what Senegal uh, does. Uh, uh, Senegal is a country that has developed uh, a test kit which only costs a dollar. It's like a pregnancy test kit. It's a very versatile test kit uh, developed by folks at the Louis Pasteur Institute in Senegal, uh, which gives you results in 10 minutes. It not only looks for the presence of antigens uh, to tell you whether you have uh, COVID-19 at the present time, uh, but it also can tell you if you've had COVID-19 because it also tests for antibodies. You don't need a very specialized infrastructure for testing. And the country, again, acted very quickly. Uh, they've got their act together. Everybody is tested in Senegal. It's not that you've got to have uh, symptoms. You can see in this image, you know, there's social or physical distancing. Uh, they've developed uh, using uh, a printing, uh, uh, you know, material printing uh, ventilators that cost on average 60 US dollars in the United States. You know, these ventilators cost close to uh, 16 to 18,000 dollars. So it's, you know, the use of appropriate technology 
variation in technological practice, but also variation in social practices. And Senegal is the only country, uh, I think they have close to 3,500 cases uh, as of yesterday. Again, more than half have recovered. Uh, only about 40 deaths. Uh, each death, of course, uh, has value, uh, but relative to their peers, uh, and even though being a relatively poor country, they've been able to uh, keep them low. And each death, whenever it has happened, is acknowledged by a national leader by name. Uh, an obituary in some ways is read on national uh, television. And there's much to learn uh, that with few resources, uh, they have been able to get far, far better outcomes uh, than many other countries, of course. Of course, we are the classic basket, basket case here in the U.S. Um, for various reasons, and uh, leadership clearly is key. I'd be remiss if I didn't see that. Senegal is doing what most countries can't, testing everyone, symptoms or not, entering a health center for the novel coronavirus. It has no shortage of testing kit thanks to this lab at the Institut Pasteur. Researchers are developing a $1 quick diagnostic kit originally made to test for dengue fever. Patients drop blood or saliva onto the devices and wait for a bloodline to appear, like a pregnancy test, explains researcher Amadou Sal. There is no need for a highly equipped lab. It's a simple test that can be done anywhere. The idea is to rapidly produce two to four million kits, not just for us, but for African countries, so that we can detect and isolate patients quickly. The sick are administered a cheap anti-malarial drug called chloroquine, commonly found in sub-Saharan Africa where malaria is endemic. While the World Health Organization cautions the use of it, Dakar-born scientist Didier Raoult says it's an affordable treatment for poor African countries dealing with the outbreak. Hydroxychloroquine is clearing uh, the virus from uh, the respiratory system, probably making that people are no more contagious. Uh, and uh, no more sick. With only 50 ventilator machines for 16 million people, Senegalese engineers are using a 3D printing machine to produce more. While imported ventilators cost $16,000, this one is just $60. Senegal is counting the cost and it's paying off. More than a month into the outbreak, the small West African nation suffered only two deaths, with most patients treated healed. Senegal has the largest rate of recovery in patients infected with the coronavirus in Africa, the third in the world ahead of countries like the United States and France. And while it has a tiny health budget compared to those countries, it has a wealth of experience in dealing with infectious diseases and outbreaks. Over 3,000 children died of pneumonia last year in Senegal, thousands more from malaria. Coronavirus is one of many deadly infections the country is dealing with. Lessons learned from the AIDS epidemic, the recent Ebola outbreak, were key in Senegal's strategy in dealing with the pandemic. I'm optimistic because some measures are taken already. Closing the airport, no imported case coming in the country, limitation of movement, uh, confinement of people from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. I think those things can help. These measures were taken when there were less than 100 cases. Scientific modeling predicted tens of thousands of infections and hundreds of deaths. But this has not happened. Early detection and African-led research means Senegal is so far beating the odds. Nicholas Hawk, Al Jazeera, Dakar. Okay, so, you know, you see Senegal. Now let's go to France. And this is uh, an absolutely phenomenal case. We know if you look at nursing homes in the US, in the UK, and in France, almost 40 to 50% of the deaths that have happened have happened in nursing homes, which basically means that, you know, if you are a person uh, advanced in age, you, because of your underlying conditions, because of your immunity being less, uh, you are far more susceptible and that's borne out by uh, the death rates. I want to tell you the story of uh, a positively deviant nursing home uh, in France, close to Lyon, um, a nursing home which had 107 patients. The average age was 87. And uh, the 
uh, manager, Valerie Martin, uh, she basically said, you know, when the coronavirus began to make inroads in uh, nursing homes in France, not in my nursing home. And so on March 16th, the day that, you know, the lockdowns and so on were going to be implemented, she called her staff of 50 and she said, how many of you wish to volunteer to be sheltered at this nursing home with the clients? Because the government decree was that patients need to be isolated in their rooms. And of course, uh, the health workers, uh, the nurses could go in and out. And uh, what Valerie Martin asked was, uh, are you willing to shelter? at the nursing home and out of her staff of 50, 29 agreed. And you can imagine, you know, so it's completely voluntary. And 21 uh, did not because they had responsibilities, you know, young children, whatever. And the initial agreement was for a three week period. And the picture that you see is after 47 days because, you know, that three week period was extended. So, and 12 of her staff members stayed the entire duration. So basically imagine a nursing home, which initially began with no coronavirus positives because testing was done. And then after 47 days of being in quarantine, camping together, and you can see them coming out with their you know, uh, sleeping bags, there were zero cases of coronavirus in this particular nursing home because nobody was coming in, nobody was going out, and uh, they basically lived there as a family. They kept a, a, a handwritten board. Uh, you know, it's been 55 days since no family has visited. It's been 44 days since we've been together in confinement, and they called it happy confinement. You know, much like the commercial sex workers who were into healthy passions. This is happy confinement. And basically with joined hearts. And they had birthday celebrations. And here's a man who had lost his wife, who during his wedding anniversary day, you know, wanted to have a fake marriage uh, with his favorite nurse. Of course, maybe, you know, this says a little something about French men, maybe not. Uh, but uh, they had this fake event, you can see. Uh, she's uh, wrapped uh, in a beautiful uh, sheet, a sterile sheet, which is overflowing like her wedding gown. She's got flowers and the man clearly uh, looks uh, happy. Uh, I don't think they had a fake uh, honeymoon, but you get the idea. They were in it together and they made the best of it. And most importantly, this variation in practice led to zero infections. And what they did was not the norm. Uh, we know about meatpacking plants here in the US. We know about nursing homes. People are coming in and out. Uh, no testing. We could learn a lot from this nursing home in France. Uh, these are little cards uh, that, uh, little or big cards that uh, the uh, the nursing home residents made. Basically, it says, uh, uh, thank you for everything. Uh, here are some other examples. Uh, this is self-explanatory. Uh, no graduation, no celebration. We know the meaning of graduations here, at least in the US. Uh, and a Tennessee dad creates a commencement ceremony for his daughter in their driveway. Again, a variation in practice. And there are hundreds of other variations of this, you know, drive-by greetings or zoom-in uh, greetings. Uh, a beautiful uh, example of a 10-year-old girl who designs a hug curtain so that she can hug her grandparents. Again, a variation in practice uh, using just simple plastic sheets. And uh, here's a budding entrepreneur and clearly you see the relational elements uh, of this Positive Deviance Act. Uh, Dr. Ernest Patti, uh, St. Barnabas uh, Hospital, New York. And you can imagine when you are an ER physician as he is, uh, 
it is a little hard to connect with your patient if you are wearing what is a hazmat suit, you know, with a shield and with your mask and the patient sees nothing. And uh, you can see Patty in the right-hand picture uh, is wearing a smiling picture of himself. And uh, research has shown, and this comes from the Ebola days, that uh, while the hazmat suit and the shields and the mask may uh, uh, you know, connote competence, but it's deeply, deeply uh, impersonal. And uh, adding that little picture does wonders, uh, not just for the healthcare provider, but certainly uh, for the patient. It's actually a well-researched uh, uh, practice, but again, it's a variant practice. It's not the norm. It's a positively deviant practice. We also should address the relational virus, uh, especially in these days, what's happening with uh, Minneapolis and, you know, our notions of uh, policing and white policing and, you know, the fear. Uh, and of course, it's all uh, to be accepted and embraced given that is what the problem is. But one should also ask the question, are there cops who are white and uh, who have uh, developed trust uh, in African-American neighborhoods and who are an example of positive policing. Uh, who, so here's Officer Norman. I do some work at the Clinton School of Public Service, uh, which is based in Little Rock, Arkansas. Officer Norman has been on the police force of North Little Rock for many years. And uh, uh, when he's on duty or off duty or on his off day, he comes to these neighborhoods. Uh, children absolutely love him, uh, you know, because he brings them little treats. They get to sit uh, in his patrol car. I mean, we know kids are very intrigued uh, by a police car, you know, the sounds it makes and the, uh, the flickering lights. Uh, and uh, Officer Norman has found a way uh, to bridge a divide with great courage, uh, with a lot of compassion. Uh, with a sense of authenticity. And he, uh, you know, attends every wedding in these African-American neighborhoods. Uh, and you can imagine is one person through his positively deviant acts uh, shows what is uh, possible, what is possible uh, in, in a very difficult. Uh, and, you know, we may talk about uh, polio or HIV or MRSA or COVID, but stigma, discrimination, race relations, these are relational viruses. You know, they are communicated in how we treat the other. And you see uh, a variation in practice in how he treats the other, he treats his clients. He's he reframes his position, not as a policeman with, in a warrior suit, uh, but one who uh, is there uh, providing security. Uh, you know, he's dancing, he's playing basketball with young kids. He's skipping rope with uh, girls. And, uh, and there are many, you know, what we are saying is there are many people like Officer Norman around. And it is important in addressing the relational virus that we also look at positively deviant individuals and their practices. Now, one thing I have to say, it's important, in positive deviance approach, uh, and this is also a flip, you never make a hero out of the person. Uh, the hero is not the mother who adds the shoot, you know, the, the green shoots. The hero is not the commercial sex worker who uh, has a sense of timing and a sense of playing to the manliness uh, of the man. The hero in this case, it's not Officer Norman. The hero is the act. So you valorize the act. If you look at the normal curve, what does a normal curve do? The way a normal curve is set up to make inferences, it valorizes mediocrity. You know, we look at uh, central tendencies, you know, normal curve is symmetrical around the mean. And of course, the more standard deviations away you are, the more you're an outlier. And, you know, we don't like deviations from the mean. Uh, 
Uh, here is Officer uh, Norman who um, uh, engages in a behavior uh, that uh, is not common in a statistical sense. And uh, uh, he valorizes uh, in some ways, uh, his behaviors valorize uh, what is uh, possible. So uh, in summary, uh, the positive deviance uh, approach has been around. I've uh, authored a few books on this topic, lots of case studies, some journal articles. I teach, I think, what is the only class semester long on positive deviance approach here at the University of Texas at El Paso. I'm spending almost 50 to 60% of my time uh, pursuing this line of work. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, many others uh, would begin to look at this data-driven approach uh, while at the same time looking for wisdom at the margins, uh, looking for wisdom with uh, the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, who within their own cultural container uh, have solved uh, the problem. So in conclusion, I'll just say that positive deviants exist. They exist, they've been around. You don't have to manufacture positive deviance. The mother who, who adds uh, little shrimps and crabs has been doing it for years. The commercial sex worker who knows how to negotiate condom use has been doing it for years. Too often when we do research, it's like, okay, you do your research and you say more research is needed. Not so with the positive deviance approach because you, know, you found the solution. That's not a small thing. Also by its very nature, the positive deviant approach uh, can, you can begin now. You don't have to wait. You can begin now because somebody like you has been doing this and has been doing this for years. So you can begin now and you can begin with few resources because they've been doing it without access to any extra resources. So positive deviants exist, they're around. They're hidden from plain sight, but they've already solved the problem. They have done so without extra resources and against all odds, and they can be identified by seeding data through a triple somersault question. And we know that they're self-discovered. It's so important. The discovery is not made by a researcher. They self-discover their solutions. And by definition, the discovered solutions, because they don't require extra resources, are accessible. Uh, to others. And the notion of self-discovery is critical because, as we know, Socrates said that there is nothing that you learn so well as what you have self-discovered, which is the same as uh, you learn not just by hearing or by seeing, but uh, the best learning happens when you do the practice. And I think it's important to say that uh, we live in a world, and there's nothing wrong with it. I live in this world. This is how I was trained. We live in a world that privileges the discourse of evidence-based practice. We are obsessed with it. Nothing wrong with it. But what positive deviance does, that in a world that is obsessed with evidence-based practice, positive deviance represents practice-based evidence. It's the little practice variation that makes the difference. Steven Spielberg, I believe, once said that the eye behind the camera denies the existence of what it does not see. You know, we put filters. Uh, that's the reason why we don't hear, or that's the reason why we can't touch or feel, or that's the reason why we can't smell. Uh, the invitation of the positive deviance approach is for us to be fully human. Uh, to not just see what is there, but to also see what the camera denies the existence of. And so it is an invitation for us to open our minds, our hearts. And that's the reason why we started with uh, the blank screen. Uh, the notion of uh, um, beginning from zero, uh, resetting our minds, because that makes it possible for us to see things which we cannot with our own hegemonic, dominant, intellectual, um, expert uh, lenses. 
So I will end here. My email address is there. Please get in touch. I'm happy to have a conversation. Thank you very much. Signing off from El Paso, Texas. This is Arvind Singh.